um, nicknamed Always Fighting Fascism, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which I hope will become clear as we proceed. So I thought, um, since this was my partial idea, I thought I would uh, start by just talking about how the genesis of it um, and how I got to propose this panel or what the thoughts had that have been going on for me about this idea. And then Dick Cluster and Susan Bernofsky and Stephen Kessler will continue. We did have a change in our panel at the last minute. Rosine Zaros was supposed to join us and she had to cancel due to family problems. So Stephen Kessler very kindly agreed to join um, at the last minute. So he will go last so he can know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, or try to figure out what we're talking about. There's really bad light in here. Do you, do you want? No, I'm OK. You know, I'm going to change my here. I just didn't want to be shining people's No, no, no. I'm good. Um, OK, so this, the idea for this came sort of from four different angles. Um, and I don't know if there's any way to synthesize them. But one is, ever since I began translating, um, I've always been uncomfortable with the whole question of dualities this sort of, um, that are presented to the translator traditionally. Uh, you know, foreignizing, domesticating, accurate, improv improvisational, objective, subjective, beautiful or faithful. I, I think they're useful. I'm sure they're useful in certain contexts to talk about translating. But they just never felt to me true in terms of what my experience as a translator is and what happens to me when I do this work. So that's one thing. Um, then um, comes a sense that the act of literary translation has something to teach us about truth, <laughs> which is, um, and that translators, after year, five years at Banff and coming to Alta for all these years, I've never met a fascist translator. Now, I'm sure they exist, but <laughs> translators tend to have a certain sense of the world and sense of reality and sense of truth and the relativity of truth and the multiplicity of meaning, which I always think if everybody could translate even a paragraph, we might have a better world. So, um, so because this is the theme of this conference is politics, I thought, okay, this is something. So the whole question of the idea literal, to me, has political implications. And po by political, I mean we as human beings, social, political beings in the world, historical beings in the world. <clears throat> so there's that lesson that translation practice gives us. Um, okay, and then um, I went to a lecture at UC Berkeley given by Robert Alter. Um, he was, it was the Center for Jewish Studies inauguration and he was the director and I saw that he was going to be talking about his translations of Yudha Mikhai. And I thought, wow, this amazing scholar who's done so much and he chooses for this really important public lecture to talk about translation. So I was really pleased and I went and it was, it was fascinating um, and wonderful. But he, several times during the presentation, um, he would he gave passed out poems and talked about his translations and the choices he made and many times he would say okay so he, now here's here's the, what it says literally and then he would go on and say what he did and it bothered me um, and I thought okay I know Robert Alter knows that there's really no such thing as a literal translation so why is he using this term and and I looked around at people I know and didn't know, and I thought, ugh, I wish I could just say, jump up, and I didn't. <laughs> and say, what do you mean by literal? <laughs> I didn't. I kept to my seat and kept quiet. <clears throat> so um, I hope this is coming together a little bit in people's minds. Um, then there were these two articles in the New York Review of Book, both wonderful articles. And again, I'm not being critical of Robert Alter. I understand why he says that, and I understand, we all do it. We all use that term, even though we all know that it doesn't really represent what we do. Anyway, so there were these two articles in the New York Review of Books, both really wonderful articles, one by Claire Massoud on a new translation of Le Tanger. Um, and it's a great article, blah, blah, blah. It goes on, and then she says, translation is inevitably, to a degree, subjective. 
<laughs> and then, and then the quality of the translator will depend then not merely on her understanding of the mechanics of language or on her facility as a writer of prose, but also on her capacities to read as a reader of text, her sense of subtext, of connotation, of allusion, blah blah blah. And I thought to myself, what if a review of a symphony orchestra started with? To be a musician, you need to know the scale. But you also need to have a good sense of rhythm. And, <laughs> and I just, what, what it struck me is, it's not her fault. What is the level she's speaking to of understanding of what translation is? And I think that's what struck me. And then again, in the same, in the same um, issue, an article by Edmund White on Jean Giono, where he was talking about Giono's um, translation of Moby Dick in the 30s. And he says, there's two quotes. Um, he's talking about, um, he says, the translation is accurate, but Melville's strange turns of phrase, as elusive as Shakespeare's, cannot be reproduced. I don't know how that makes you feel, but. <laughs> and then again, he goes on and says, is there any way to capture Melville's biblical Shakespearean prose in French? La plus petite chose peut avoir une signification doesn't really capture the diction of the various trifles capriciously carry meanings. And again, I'm not blaming Edmund White. I think, I think he's, you know, this is a really interesting article and he's exploring things. But again, it just brought up for me, what is the level, the reader of the New York Review of Books, what is the, what is the level of understanding of what translation is and can do? So, so, that's, so how can we talk about what we do in ways that more, we are wordsmiths. That's what we do, I think, principally, or to a large extent. So we think we could find ways to talk about what we do and educate others that's a little more um, accurate and enlightening. So that's my question. I don't have any answers. I have a few sort of, I think all of us, and you know, we read articles by all of us, and many people in this room have written articles, have, have used metaphors to talk about what we do, but somehow it's not getting out into the general public. And so that, I guess that's the idea. It's like, what can we do um, to talk about translation in a different way? Um, do I have another two minutes? Okay, so I, a few things that I would, I, a few things that I'd throw out there to talk, um, talk about, not talk about whether translations are accurate or, or beautiful or faithful, but t t think about translation as convincing. Like, where is the conviction, the conviction of the translator, or is it a convincing translation? Um, so I think of the example of Hamlet. Does, did he know that Polonius is behind the curtain when he's in his mother's bedchambers before he stabs? Well, it's not in the script. So the idea as a, as a director, the director needs to tell the actor, okay, you need to decide, and then be convincing in that decision. There's no right or wrong, and I think that's something as translators, our reading, which is what we manifest in our, in our translation, we have to be convinced of that reading. And how well do we do that is one way of talking about how well um, we do it. Or we could talk about the breadth and the depth of the reading that's reflected in the translation, rather than the accuracy or the beauty or the, I don't know, I'm just playing with ideas. And then one other thing that um, I thought about, which is rarely, talked about with translation is our, our medium, as it is for all writers in English, is, is language, and specifically the English language, which has particular meaning as translators. So one way to think about it, I think about it, is how well or how effectively has the translator harnessed the potential of the English language. Um, so all these ideas are, can be discussed at length, but I'm just throwing them out there and then let some other people take it from there. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to try to alternate between continuing to debunk the notion of literal and with each debunk, I hope, toss out some other way of looking at what they do, what we do. So if I look out here right now, I'm, I'm looking at this room and I say, I see Danuta, I see Mark, I see Gary, I don't see Allison, even though she says she would be here. <laughs> um, am I describing literally what I see? 
Yeah, I'm describing literally what I see, except for the part about Alice and what she said. Um, but there are nine million other ways I could describe literally what I see. So if words describe things, as we all know, so what, what does it mean to say they describe them literally with all those choices? <clears throat> when I used to teach critical thinking and reading and writing to freshmen, the way I did it was by doing translation exercises some language to language, but mostly like social discourse to social discourse. How do you describe something in a letter? How do you describe it when you're sitting in a bar? How do you describe it to your mother? Which of those is literally true? So, it's a, so everything, everything we write and say is an act of construction. This is not new to you. It's an act of interpretation. Um, could we des describe ourselves as um, selectors, critical thinkers, choosers, all those kind of things which are, in essence, what wordsmiths do? Um, what writers do. There's this idea that because what we're doing is turning words into words, that, oh, then somehow there's this one-to-one -one equivalency. There's lots of ways we can talk about how there's, how there's not, um, and I'll give one example in a minute. Um, another thing we might describe ourselves as is guides. I've been thinking a lot lately about um, cultural translation. I just had a Cuban writer that I translated visit, and we did a bunch of readings and Q&As. And uh, what most, <laughs> yeah, good morning. And what most, <laughs> I just yeah, used. He already told me about you. <laughs> what most, <laughs> what most fascinated um, the audiences actually when they asked question and answer was the little ways in which in the translation we worked in ways to explain stuff that the Cuban reader knows that they don't know. And I think it was also because they were seeing that she didn't speak English, she reads English well, but she didn't speak English. So in the Q&A, they saw me interpreting. They saw all the ambiguities of interpretation that we sort of had to pause over. And they asked more and more questions about this. OK, an example. It came from a workshop the uh, day before yesterday. Uh, the Cuban word, habao. Is there a literal interpretation for this word? Let's see. A habao describes a, a person who is very light colored, almost albino, but with lots of African uh, genes and with freckles. And you have to understand that in Cuba, people are much more open than here about being overt in their physical descriptions of people and their reference to race. That's the definition of modal. <laughs> is it literal? No. So what we are is, is guides. We're guides to these other understandings that are built into the words, but that you're looking up the word in the dictionary and choosing among three equivalents is not going to guide this, our readers to, to what the original intended reader knew. Um, what's the literal meaning of a pun? The whole point of a pun is that it has no literal meaning. Um, and then I come back to thinking about, uh, about Melville. Um, why did Bartleby not like to continue to recopy things over and over and over again? Subject to interpretation, but presumably, among other things, because copying the same word without changing it is, 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 is stultifying. And so we are, we are creators, we are guides, we are interpreters. Now I want to throw out that we're also something like Supreme Court justices. <laughs> um, and this ties to the <clears throat> to the political point that Katie was making. Think about the arguments about loose and strict construction of the Constitution. Okay, <clears throat> what does the Constitution literally have to say about net neutrality? <laughs> and yet, the Constitution has something to say about net neutrality, and it has to be interpreted, it has to be asked. Um, on voting rights, if you look at the original Constitution and you look at the later amendments and the post-Civil War amendments, clearly it's a contradictory document. It's purposely a contradictory document. So is much of what we translate. Including, including those contradictions is an important part of what we do, and, and, and making them um, evident is an important part of what we do. Um, to take an example, the opposite of the internet, here's an amendment to the Constitution. A well-regulated militia being, that comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed. So all the debates today about gun control laws hinge on A, what did militia mean at the time this was written, and B, 
what the hell do those commas do? <laughs> They're trying to say the right of the people to keep in their arms and the, and the well-regulated militia are two things or are one thing. How did they understand commas at that time? We do this constantly when we, when we interpret things in order to translate them. So we are, who knows, Supreme Court justices, scholars of, of whatever you might call that. Um, the Bill of Rights also has a prologue, which I didn't realize until I went to look up the text of the Second Amendment. It has a whole prologue justifying in terms of people's, how to build people's confidence in the government. Without, that prologue affects everything, affects how we understand every one of those amendments, just as what's on the first stanza of the poem or pages one to a hundred of the novel affects what we do on page 293 or, or in the last stanza. So again, I, I don't have the word yet, but try to think about how what Supreme Court justices supposedly do is described and see if you can come, come up with the word. And then finally, um, and maybe this is a word that, that audiences could relate to better, we are impersonators, as Katie said about the actor. We are, as literary translators, we are impersonating the writer in the act of impersonating a narrator's voice, a, a, a poetic speaker's voice, and we do this like additional impersonation that we are impersonating um, them as if they spoke English. Uh, so, I hope that broadens all the senses of what's not literal and contributes a little bit to the discussion of what other words we might use. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm not up next. Um, I was so happy when Katie started talking about what this panel was going to be because I've had so much difficulty just in communicating with my students and communicating about with the administrators at my university about what translation is. So I'm going to talk out of school and talk a little bit about the classroom and the perils of the notion of the literal and then talk about trying to talk about translation to people on the outside, which I think that we, I agree absolutely that we need to get better at doing. And in a sense, you know, I'm looking out here and I see some of the best translators in the country sitting in this room <laughs> who are deep thinkers about what we do. And so maybe, you know, the Q&A can become a little workshop session and we do some collective brainstorming about ways we can talk about our profession in a useful way. Now, Everyone uses the word literal all the time. Well, not Katie anymore. No, I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. I literally do. Chris Merrill just did in, the, you know, in, in, his, in his keynote. And I use it in my classroom, too, because it's a shorthand. It's a shortcut for, for talking about a certain approach to translation. And I want to say something about the trajectory that typically I see translation students following in the classroom around this concept and I'm wondering if changing, changing the paradigm, the way we talk about translation could maybe change this. So literal, sometimes I'll use the word dictionary translation to talk about it, but you know, when we say literal, what do we mean in the classroom? We mean that the students are using a lot of cognates, probably un without questioning the cognates enough. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to make. I'm not going to add to the list of what's wrong with literal and give you a whole bunch of examples of how it goes wrong because every single person in this room already knows all about this. Um, what happens if you use too many cognates when they're not supposed to be used? It means also, in a terms of thinking about sentence structure, basing English language sex sentence structures on the sentence structures of the original language in a way that is not productive or helpful or beautiful or effective in English. Katie talked about convincing translation and I think that is a crucial thing to keep in mind and I think we need more terms about that. I talk to my students about selling a word or selling a concept in the sentence and that's the language, I might now adopt the language being convincing. Um, you know, I will give one example of this just from my own work, um, Kafka's Metamorphosis. Um, Gregor Samsa has made a picture frame with ornate little 
cuttings like of the sort that are you might see on on the wall right behind you actually that he of a picture frame that he's done with a fret saw and my editor immediately said well I don't know what a fret saw is can you make it a band saw <laughs> those of you who are laughing know something about saws right <laughs> so a fret saw is a tiny little thing like a, a, a small jigsaw whereas a band saw is a large table saw that you know is a piece of furniture which <laughs> Um, I had to, you know, I had to learn about this, but I realized that my editor, my editor was objecting to the worst use of the word fret saw because of how I had placed it in the sentence. Um, namely, you know, Gregor's mother is talking to the, the procurist about, you know, her son's um, fret saw projects. <laughs> and it, the problem was that the, 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 the concept fret saw was not sold well in the, in the phrase fret saw projects. Mm -hmm. And if I, I then, after my editor said, you must change fret saw to something else, I started thinking, how can I sell this better so she won't notice that I put a kind of saw she doesn't recognize in there. And you know, it turned into something like, you know, woodworking project with a fret saw or something like that. You know, I, or, you know, he was doing woodworking projects and then later blah, 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 carving the frame with his fret saw. And then somehow it was sold differently and the editor <laughs> forgot that she had minded. Um, <laughs> and so I talked to students about that a lot, you know, recasting, and that's getting away getting away from, oops, the literal. Um, and so we need better ways to talk about that. You know, maybe it's getting away from copying an exact syntactical structure, and maybe we have to get a little more discursive in our description of what we're doing. So what I see in students' sort of journeys when they come to translation for the first time in my classroom, and I can see them starting from zero, um, typical trajectory at first, the translations use way too many cognates, you know, are syntactically way too bound to the original, make cultural assumptions, you know, assume that the English language reader is going to understand the same things that the reader of the original did. And then, and then, I'll, and then I start saying things in class like, okay, this is a way much too literal an approach. Um, you know, you have to, you know, find a way to make this text you have to write this text, you have to find a way to make it your own. So I'll use language like that. And what often happens is that the students will come back and bring in texts that are so much their own that the relationship with the original becomes so tenuous that we'll say, okay, this isn't, this isn't really translation anymore. And they'll say, but you said we were being too liberal, right? Um, and besides, this author's style, you know, this is very German or very Polish or very whatever it is. And it's, it's not, you know, I don't feel this as a writer in English. So I'm, I've just written what I am thinking might be that writer's style. In fact, they're doing an impersonation, but then something that we feel is too loose an impersonation to be a translation. So who can help me find better language to describe to them what they need to be doing when they're moving farther away from you know, certain strictures and then closer to them because ideally we want language that's going to help them find a synthesis and I'm still, I'm still looking for it. So I would, I would like help for finding that. But I think this notion of convincing translation, um, we, we, need, we need better words for this. And this is, ideally this would be the panel presentation where I say, okay, I figured that out. These are the words. Here's my proposal. <laughs> I don't have it yet. It's a, it's, a work, it's a work in progress. I want to read to you, though, a semi-related document. Um, because I'm up for tenure at Columbia University and because it's the first time that a literary translator has stood for translation as a literary translation, to, as a literary translator in the history of the university. And, the, and, and my dean is there for, we'll s see if it works for a second. <laughs> And my, and my dean is therefore asking me to teach the university what translation is. <laughs> I've been asked to write about what translation is, what we do. And I've, yeah, I spent three months writing this document. I wrote the 20-page version. I wrote the, the version that, you know, people may think that translation is looking up words in a dictionary, blah, blah, blah. But in fact, it's, you know, the very defensive version of it. Um, <laughs> And fortunately, I didn't turn it in. And the longer, the longer I worked on it, the shorter it became until it's only a one-page, single-spaced statement, which is short. So I'm now going to read it to you. Now, it's pitched to 
the dean of the School of the Arts in which, among other things, it's my job to talk about why translation is a form of writing and a useful practice for writers who are not going to be professional translators. So some of this is irrelevant to us. But I think um, talking about translation as writing is something that we should do more of in general. So the, here's, here's my first stab at this, you know, what I think is a collective project of us talk, thinking more together about how we talk about our work. The art of translation. Literary translation is a form of writing with extreme constraints. As rigorous as the composition of a sonnet or sassina, it requires not only a deep understanding of how style is created, but also the ability to write in many different styles, not only a sophisticated mastery of tone and nuance, but a sense of the direction which a particular word choice will nudge a sentence not only a profound familiarity with the cultural context in which a given original is written, but the ingenuity to make it come alive in another tongue. There is a sleight of hand inherent in all artistic translation, an ability to intuit the way Bolaño or Krasna Horkheim will sound, or would sound if they wrote in English, that's basically what Dick said, um, which among other things means taking into account all the literary and artistic innovations that distinguish their writing within the Spanish language and Hungarian traditions. Translation means pushing the boundaries of English to accord with the ways authors push the boundaries of whatever language they write in, even or especially when the innovations have arisen organically within a specific linguistic context. Translation also offers writers a way to expand their horizons with regard to what is sayable, thinkable in English. Young writers attempting their first translations are forced to confront the limits of their own sensibilities and skill, an inspiration and invitation to experiment and grow. Many who grew up bilingual are dismayed to discover that translation does not come naturally to them. Others whose foreign language skills are spotty discover that they have a powerful natural ability to intuit the essence of a foreign author's sentences. Although I should footnote, I think that somebody who is a professional practicing translator in the world does need to know the other language very well. Like other forms of writing, <laughs> this, this is pitched to, this, that, that's, that's the sentence that's pitched to the School of the Arts at Columbia. Like other forms of writing, translation is mastered through a combination of talent and discipline. The joy of translation, and this I think is why so many writers are captivated by the art, is that years of practice make it possible to grasp a sentence paradoxically as something liberated from language, as a set of impulses, rhythms, patterns, and sounds that can be abstracted from the written words that embody it in its original language. The translator studies a phrase, turning it over and over, and then in a sort of alchemy lifts it out of language to be suspended briefly in the translator's mind before being wrapped in new words that fit so perfectly they seem organically conjoined with what the text is saying. Walter Benjamin wrote of the difference between originals and translations as that between the skin of a fruit and royal robes draped around it in loose, graceful folds. In translation practice at the highest level of the art, the robe encases the orange as snugly as any peel. So this is really metaphorical in, in, in a large sense, and obviously it's pitched towards a dean. But I think that thinking about, talking about our craft in terms of writing first, and not just first and foremost in, term, in terms of copying and representation is a way to strengthen the, how our field is viewed from the outside, and maybe, you know, also a key to how to talk to our students. But um, anyway, it's a work in progress, so I want more contributions. And I this. think we should give her tenure, don't you? Think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I am so relieved. Thank you. Hmm. I am too. <laughs> well, actually, um, I, I don't know what I can add except from a slightly different angle because I think I'm the only person on the panel who's a specialist in poetry as opposed to prose. Um, so it's 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 a it's a formal distinction, um, but I can talk about. A little bit. I mean, the one of the first notes I made before we were even talking was translation is 
writing, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, it's something that, that really has, can never be emphasized enough to people who are not initiated. Um, because uh, a question I frequently get, because I'm also a poet and a journalist and a critic and an essayist, um, uh, people frequently ask me, um, you know, I say, well, I'm working on a project or I have a new book coming out, and they say, oh, is it a translation or is it your own writing? <laughs> you know, and I say, well, translation is actually my own writing. You know? um, and when I'm, a when I'm doing translation, I'm not being a stenographer. I'm actually mm -hmm. writing um, an original piece of work. And the, 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 the proof of that is if you give you know, two or three different translators the same text, they'll come up with three different results. So um, that's something that I think you know, when we're talking to civilians about this, uh, <laughs> you know, that it, it's important to, to remind them. Um, one of the things that occurred to me while listening to, to uh, Dick and Katie and Susan is that um, uh, we're, I think we're at a different stage culturally in the literary culture of the United States than we were when I started translating 45 years ago. Uh, in that there were hardly any translations when I started out. I mean, it's one of the things that got me started translating was that the translations I was reading of the only, you know, two or three poets that you could even find in translation um, from Spanish. I was, I was looking at, the, at the, 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 the original across the page, and I was looking at, you know, somebody's translation, that, which, you know, in my 20s, I assumed that was somehow authoritative. If this person is a published translator, they must know what they're doing. And, it, and but I was looking at these at these translations, and I was going, no, that doesn't really really sound that way to me. And you know, maybe I'll take a shot at it. I mean, I I have my high school Spanish. I have got straight A's in it. But you know, I, I I'm not a native speaker. I uh, I had a good sense of the language, and I knew the grammar, and, um, but I, I didn't claim to be you know, fluently bilingual by any stretch of the imagination. But I was writing uh, my own original poetry, and I brought that to bear on what the translations would sound like. OK, so from, the, from this early phase of the, you know, the late 60s, early 70s, when I started paying attention to this kind of stuff, um, uh, there are many, 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 thanks to Alta and all of you and a lot of other people, there are, there are many more uh, translations now out there. And I think the more, trans the more translators sort of infiltrate the, the culture at large, the, the better understood what we do will be. Um, so uh, Gregory Rabassa famously has spoken of, of the, the critic called, he calls Professor Horrendo. <laughs> Uh, you know, who reviews your translation in the New York Times and, and points out the inaccuracies in the, in the, you know, from the dictionary. Um, and uh, I think Professor Horrendo is, you know, sort of fading into, into uh, well, there's, still a, lot, there's a, still a lot of ignorance about what translation is, but I think that there are enough translators willing to fight for translation as an art that, um, there are fewer professors, horrend Professor Horrendos. Uh, there, you know, there's not quite as much fascism and dogmatism, uh, uh, I, I think, in the in the critical community. Even though there are, there's, I think there's more ignorance of people who think, well, it's a translation, you know, therefore it's like stenography, and and if it's if it's not, uh, you know, to the letter of the original. Um, it, it's not a good translation. But I, I, just to speak up for um, a kind of retrograde concept that, that Susan actually uh, was illustrating, what, what she described as when she tells her students to loosen up and then they take it to the other extreme. Um, I know when I started out, uh, I, was, I was really trying to be faithful to the words, you know, and, and when I was trying to decide between one word and, and another, I was thinking, well, this is what it really says, you know, because I, I was just, I, I didn't have the confidence to trust my own imagination. Um, and I think, I think of that period as sort of my training wheels as a translator. Um, and, and kind of, it was good to be conservative as a beginner, because I wanted to be sure I wasn't going too far from what the author was saying. My, and my practice over all this time now has, has evolved to where 
I have so much more confidence in my ability to understand what's going on in the text that I feel freer to, you know, to make my own departures from the letter as a way, as you all know, of getting closer to the meaning of, of what's there. So I work now way more intuitively than I ever had the confidence of doing uh, when I was starting out. And I think for beginning translators, it, it is, I mean, that's something I say to people. That I, I'm not, I don't teach professionally, but occasionally um, somebody asks me to do an independent study or they show me their translations and ask me what I think. And what I usually tell them is, loosen up. You know, you're, you're staying way too close to the, to the text, uh, to the words of the text, and you're totally, you're, you're missing, you know, three quarters of what we do, which is, you know, tone, it's, it's uh, atmosphere, it's, it's mood, it's style, it's, I mean, there's so many sort of ineffable aspects that um, you can't, it's really impossible to put your finger on. And when people say, you know, I tell them I translate poetry, and they say, oh, that must be really difficult. And I say, well, yeah, uh, it is. <laughs> uh, but, you know, on the other hand, it's a lot of fun, because I get to write a new poem. Um, and and it's, it's something that, you know, for me, is really exhilarating. I learn so much from, my, from the poets that I translate. And as a poet myself, I feel like I'm taking a workshop, like a master class, in, in poetry, when I'm translating, you know, Luis Cernudo or Borges or, or Alexandre, uh, it, it's like, wow, it's like what a privilege to be able to immerse myself in the, in the, this, in the, the sensibility and the, and the voice and the style and the, and the, the, the creation of this other writer and, and try to represent that in a, in a way that is, is persuasive to, the, to the, 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 the reader. I know one of the things that I, I mean, an argument that I have with some of the prevailing translation theory is this idea of foreignizing, you know. Um, I mean, I really want the reader to forget that they're reading a translation. I want them, and this has to do with the conviction, you know, I want them to be, be fooled into, into thinking that they're reading an original uh, poem. Um, and w the way I described it in the preface to the book I just finished is that uh, my goal is to, is to create a reliable illusion of what uh, is going on in the original Spanish. So um, th those, are the, those are the few, uh, a few of the things. Let me see if there's anything else uh, that has uh, been said that is worth riffing on a little bit. Um, the idea of uh, translation for a better world, uh, it, you know, it, it, we, we do have a kind of evangelical mission, you know, with every book we translate or every text we translate, and we're trying to project the voice of that author. It's like standing on the street corner, you know, uh, uh, preaching, uh, and, and trying to, to get people's attention and, and to convince them that, like, this work, reading this work will save your soul in some way. Um, so I, I, I like that, um, that, that concept of you know, being missionaries for, for literature, really. One of the things I love about Alta, as distinct from you know, some other kinds of writers' conferences that I'm sure many of us have attended, is that everybody here, in addition to being a creative writer, is, has a, a dedication to literature. You know, and as a dedication to an author other than themselves, and and most of them, most of them, yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, but to me, that's just so liberating for me as a as a writer. You know, of setting apart my my life as a translator. It's like for me, just to have the 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 the, the privilege of representing these other voices is. Um, it's a, just a great, a, a great thing to do because I, you know, the reason I got into this business because I love literature, I love poetry, and and I want, I want to to uh, to spread the the news, you know. So, um, uh, I should we I, open it up? Yeah, let, let's open it up because I'm sure I'm let's, all you guys. Okay, say. let's. Yeah, or we can we can I, respond I, can to I each other. One? I I just yeah, want to. I, I okay. I'm gonna take. I'm gonna be dictator. <laughs> in my, in my <laughs> fight, <laughs> <laughs> a, a dictator who understands the multiplicity of meaning. 
Um, just one thing, I just I wanted to clarify I, I, what you say is absolutely um, true too. But what I was saying is it's not the books that we're evangelizing. That I think what I meant in this case was the act of translation is a saving of the soul. The act of translation of anything, even of a, of a document that's not particularly literary, I think. Anytime you grapple with equivalencies in language, you are informed about multiplicity of meaning and possibilities for interpretation, and the fact that truth is not black and white, as represented by language. So I guess that, but you, what, so I just wanted to um, yeah, clarify no that what had been no my argument, intention. No Susan. And I wanted to say, that was, that was really interesting. Um, I think we're using the word literal so much because the word faithful has gone out of favor. We're all, we're all tired of like Larry Venuti slapping us around because we said faithful once too many times. Um, but I think we should think about when, we're, if we're thinking, I see people talking about in various different formulations, semantics yeah. and everything else. Yeah. And there's a separation of thinking about meaning, content, you know, what I, I have in my statement, like what the text says, mm -hmm. what I put in scare quotes because I don't really mean it, but I do. Um, and then everything else, the form, the, you know, the, thing, the, the, the things. Stephen was just talking about, um, and I, want, I wanted, to, there's, there's an exercise that I, stole from someone that I sometimes do and that's grab a the first a paragraph of a translation and original and show it to my students and ask them you know a language that's commonly known and ask them which was the original which is the translation they very very often get it wrong and the reason that they get it wrong is that the translation is often smoother and reads better than you know that then the, the original the original be weird and so they think the weirdness is you know but no the weirdness you know writing write, writing writing is weird um, which I'm, I'm, I'm which I'm bringing up just to say that you know the more we the more we think about our privilege to use the language as writers when we're translating I think the more interesting translations we're, we're we're going to write, and so, all right. I just said two things. That's not coherent, you know. <laughs> it's okay. I want us. I want us to, to do it more consciously and yes. talk about it more consciously. Yes. That's the two things. Uh, just two quick things. Um, so I also think about teaching poetry, which you know I've done sometimes, and saying to students, well, you know, before you jump at what the figurative meaning of the poem is, think about what the literal meaning is. And I realized that actually, what I, about a but what I mean by that, and could say it differently if I were to do this in the future, one is like we're looking at what is the, what is the narrative, what are the physical images, and then the other is what are all the other meanings and sounds and rhythms. So however we feel like to talk about that, the thing to stress about translation is if it doesn't do all of that, it's, it's not a translation. The only other thing I have to say is that thinking about um, Susan's image about how we kind of abstract all those things from the original language and then alchemize it into the new one. Could we call ourselves, and so I'm having this evaporation, <laughs> can we call ourselves moonshiners? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's open it up to all you brilliant people. Um, Marion had her hand up first and then Jason. Um, first of all, thank you. This was very stimulating, shall we say. Um, and I maybe, Susan, maybe I didn't hear the whole statement, maybe I spaced out a little bit. But one thing that um, I keep coming back to is that translators need to read in their language they write in. And that as a, in, a, in an educational situation, the, the teaching of translation is also um, the students are using their experience in writing, but the, the, the broadening of their understanding of, of uh, literature and styles is also another factor. Um, and that kind of goes into my other, uh, one of my other, I have three comments. The second one is about this idea of convincingness, which I really like. And I think that, to me, the, uh, the reason often that texts aren't convincing is that they use a very poor set of 
English devices. They're using the devices that match, that overlap. Oh, we can do that. We can do the same kind of thing. But English can do all these other things. Yeah. That, that, and that goes to what I said next, which was harnessing. Yes. I don't know if you were here. Did you I come in late? Right. Um, Harnessing the potential of the English language. Right. And, and I guess the, the last thing is I would object to the idea that there's the semantic meaning and then there's all that other stuff because all that other stuff is meaning too. It's not just an effect, it's meaning. Right. And um, if you can't uh, translate the syntax into meaning, Especially non-standard syntax or anything that's special, then you're missing you're missing content. You're missing this denotive. Well, that's precisely what this panel's about. Yeah. We know this, and how how can we talk about it? And exactly, yeah. How can we how can we get that across? Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, again, this was a wonderful panel. Thanks very much. Um, just a couple of comments. One, um, I very much appreciate this notion of talking about translation as writing. Um, I mean, I love I love all the metaphors too, but so, sometimes I feel like the the, the less that we the, you know if we can use metaphors less than you know that's that's a lot better. So starting you know with something very grounded. Um, the other question uh, or just the thing I wanted to put out there was, I mean, we translators are very good about thinking about our audience and knowing our audience, and we have you know different types of ignorance, right? Um, about translation, you know, we have a dean, we have like this reviewer, um, we have the guy on the street, and I mean, <clears throat> we can all think about the million different misconceptions people have about translation. But I'm wondering here if it might be useful for us to kind of think about some of the you know main uh, sort of taxonomy of ignorance about translation, right? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking of, you know something along the lines of like those Mr. Men books popped up in my head, those like kids books. You, you know, you would have like you know Mr. Uh, Mr. Ac too academic, Mr. Mm -hmm. you know, Something like that, um, and so so that we could sort of gear our uh, you know arguments toward them or our pitches toward these different types of ignorance. And so the question is, do we want to be defensive or offensive? Well, in, right. Defining in, in, in some, some cases, we need to be defensive, right? Um, I think, um, or, or just find the land, or maybe not even defensive or offensive. But again. So Edmund White is great and Claire Massoud is great, but if a translator writes a review of a translation, what language will we use to talk about it? And how can we elevate that? How can we both educate and elevate that discourse? Well, right. I mean, you have, you have people who think about very deeply about literature, but have never thought about translation. You have people who Maybe. thought about foreign languages a lot, but you know, have never considered exactly. the kind of literary books. So OK, let's, um, Leah and then Bill. Um, just something that you said about the, the taxonomy of ignorance. Um, I was thinking, <laughs> uh, next year at Alta, I would love to have us do some interactive workshops where at the individual tables we talk amongst ourselves and come up with some ideas um, of this topic, ways to address um, specific kinds of, of misinformation about what translation is, and maybe compile a document that we can put up on our new website um, to you know, to provide all of our members with ideas of ways that we can address this. Um, I, um, great idea. That's by a great the idea. way, I think we could do that, of course, um, talking about teaching, too. I'd like mm -hmm. to see us do that next Well, week. it's actually in the, in the panel that I will also be on in the afternoon. We talk about professionalism. I hope we talk a little bit about that, too, in terms of setting standards and we defining it. And Alta could do that anyway. Bill. Yeah, I think Jason's idea is really um, wonderful because there are many uh, many ignorances that we're um, battling with. And, um, I'm also extremely grateful because I've, I've also been wrestling with this, quite, this uh, word, literal. Um, and I, I guess I just wanted to, to um, suggest two possible, I guess, strategies or, or areas to think about. One is um, taken from linguistics, where if we talk about a literal translation of a sentence, um, I don't know how many people here have seen um, the kinds of glosses that are used in the study of linguistics, um, but they're basically incomprehensible. Um, you have the words are set out in a sentence, and under each, under each word is a, it will say, you know, see, for example, third person, plural, future, da da da. It's got all of the, the so called semantic or grammatical information there, but when you look at it, you can't actually make sense of it. And I think that kind of reduction sometimes helps um, people to see that even translating very, very simple sentences, um, there is no such thing even as a literal translation. Um, the other kind of point where we haven't really questioned things is the, is the word dictionary. Mm. 
Um, mm -hmm. There's an assumption that we know what that is, and I think it, it very often comes from, first of all, bad dictionaries. Um, <laughs> but also, you know, for all of us, when we learned our languages, you remember the little, little notebook that you had with vocabulary? Where you had, you know, chair, chairs, and fauteuil, whatever. Um, and and you see, it's a one-to-one -one thing. We, that's how we think about the equivalence between language. And uh, sometimes I show my um, students a page from my own um, a copy of uh, the Stanislavski dictionary that I use. Um, and I use the word ciężki, which means um, in the one-to-one -one version is heavy. Um, and Stanislavski has, I think, 60 different words for this incredibly simple, everyday, normal Polish word. It can be stolid. It can be um, uh, plodding. It can be weighty. Ciężki um, idiota is like a complete idiot, for example. Um, and I think that also um, questioning when we talk about using the dictionary and the, what it says in the dictionary, we don't even, uh, I think we should be questioning what dictionary we're we talking about and how dictionaries are, are themselves um, put together and used. I think that also, that's another level of ignorance that, um, that many people suffer from. And I mean, just to, to follow up on that, one of the other things which I didn't say in my original words is this whole idea of um, that we don't translate words. And I think that's really important to repeat over and over. It's something I forget. It's something, um, and this came up in, at BAMP. We had this a panel that was, Stephen was part of um, um, where we compared musical uh, performance with with translation. And we talked about, do we, do we translate words? Do they play notes? Mm -hmm. You know, or do they play measures, or do they, you know, so the whole idea of um, that we are not translating words, and that's exactly so, yeah, you can't replace literal for the dictionary definition, though you could, I, I suppose for one word, you could say, here's the range of the dictionary definition. But then you say the adjective yeah. and the noun, and you have exactly. six possibilities here, exactly. there, and that's already an awful lot of possibilities. Exactly, and I feel like as a translator, I'm still struggling to remember at every minute that I'm not translating words. I feel like it's something I have to constantly remind myself of. Um, I'm constantly telling the students, please just try and think in phrases. Right. As you would if you were writing. And, and that's where, you know, we well, can all, yeah. And what did I just say, yeah. Yeah, as if you were writing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like these are habits. Yeah. But, but again, again, I agree with Jason, I think you said, about using metaphors. I also, you know, I. Somebody's talk about it as like an actor or like a, and I, again, it's like, wh wh here we are, we're the wordsmiths. Why are we using metaphor? Why can't we just say what we do? Um, because it would be too literal. <laughs> well, because no. writers, we frequently resort but to I also words. someone, and I, I will play devil's advocate here, we are not writers in the sense of it, there is a difference between writing original and translating, just like there's a difference between writing a script for a play and acting. And we have very special skills that writers don't necessarily have. And that we are writing in a certain, con we are interpretive, and we are working from a script. So it is different, and, but that's another whole conversation. But I think it also, we have to think about that. And to just say, well, we're also writers. Yes, we are, but we're a very particular kind of writer. And in some ways, we have certain skills and certain, our ability to harness the potential of the English language should be more developed than most, than many people who publish under their own name. And I think are. I think we as, as wordsmiths, as translators, that is our area. That is our expertise. That is our power. Um, then, I'd like to share one thing that's been useful for me. Um, I find that when I'm talking to uh, people who think they know something or who do know something <laughs> about translation, I'm always defensive. I'm saying like stupid things, like I can account for every word in the original. I don't, I've even said like ridiculous things like that. It's just the way certain questions have been phrased and I've had to respond to it. Like, yeah, yeah, chapter one is not literal, but chapters after that are literal. You know, it's just yes. silly. However, what the breakthrough for me came when I saw that people were responding, actually not to the writing, but to the understanding, you know? Mm. So it's not so much about translating words, but about translating authors, or understanding the source. So with the Gita, it was about understanding sort of where it's mm. coming from, and, and that whole context, and the whole uh, aura of it, and you know, getting into the groove of that. And with Kalidasa, it's been about you know, this is how Kalidasa looks at this. So the conversation then moves to 
completely different areas. It's no longer about are you being faithful or not. It's about together appreciating something that actually is amazing. And then when I do that, then nobody is questioning what I'm doing in the language. I suddenly feel it becomes collaborative, almost like a collaborative appreciation or a friendship of two people appreciating this this author that they haven't looked at for a long time. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, moving it away from writing altogether actually works very well for me. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about, with the Gita, I find I'm talking about spiritual practice, all kinds of stuff, and then after that they're like, my God, we loved your reading, and you've given us <laughs> so much about the Gita that we never even mm -hmm. thought it was so dramatic. Or, you know, And those would never have come at me if I had simply gone on, I'm this wordsmith and I've looked at all these like, Mm -hmm. I would never have got to that stage with it. Which is also, that's really helpful to me, and, and I like the idea of collaboration because your other collaborator is, is the author, if you're doing a text that you know who the author is, of course. And um, for me, it's just listening to a bunch of your comments all lining up and thinking about the classroom part of it, and also as someone who comes to translation from poetry, uh, who had a lot more training in poetry before I started thinking through what translation is and how translation fits into the poetry curriculum and vice versa. Um, it was really interesting to hear me use the word, to hear you use the word conviction, but then we kind of replaced it with convincing, uh, or the work of convincing as it goes towards the communication with the editor. But to go back to conviction and to think about translation in the classroom and the different disciplines of the students that might be in that classroom, helping them find their conviction and helping them find their authority is also really important for what you guys are doing as the, as the leaders of that workshop, uh, to go into the text, the, the source text, and to go into collaboration with the author of that source text, and to build uh, <coughs> authority within that, that makes sense to them. Um, that seems important, which is why the process that you're describing that you see again and again, Susan, actually just uh, might need to be the process, because that's a way for those students to find their authority um, that, that they can describe and rationalize. And the other thing, as a poet, for me, um, I don't want to toss out the metaphors, because the metaphors are literally the translators. Like, they literally <laughs> are the translators. Like, that word means translation, right? Like, this is a right. thing we carry across. The metaphors are us. And the metaphors uh, are both literal, and they have real things in them. They have a velvet dress on lemon, for some reason. Um, and then they are something that makes no sense. They are the paradox that is shed when we put those two textures together, and the different senses that are called upon to make sense of that. There's no word that you could use that wouldn't be a metaphor. So for me, as a poet who comes to translation, um, I, I think that we can encourage our students to dwell in that middle phase um, regardless of the goals that we have for them and they have for themselves to come later, I think that middle phase where they're taking too many liberties and they're in the metaphor phase and they might be writing some kind of velvety citrine translation um, and then they're working as, maybe they're working now a little too far away we feel from the original they're into their artistry but then you can invite them, <laughs> depending on their goals, you could say okay now run away into the hills with this and this is just your new work that is after Lurko. Or you can say, no, 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 you're a Lurka translator, Where do you, how much do you need to step back? So I'm just, I, just, I would say, as someone who comes from a, dis a different discipline, that those metaphors are important for building authority, um, aesthetic authority over the text. And it's an area to go to form collaboration with the text and the writer. So that's another place on the spectrum, on the different spectrum that we're kind of building here. Yeah, may maybe, the, maybe we're talking about two different things. But, oh. Okay, maybe we're talking about two different things about metaphor. Maybe I think he was talking more about in terms of how we talk to the outside world, how we talk about translate, yeah. right? And you're talking more maybe in the classroom or to other people. Yeah, poets. perhaps, and this, this actually doesn't contradict anybody's because it has right. to do with what you're talking about to begin with, but who your audience is when you're trying to discuss translation. So you're absolutely right. I think we should also have t-shirts printed next year that said metaphors are us. I think I'm from what you Joel said, actually. I also, I both translate and write, and Though these two works are very uh, intimately connected for me, nevertheless, I, I experienced a very s important distinction between the two, which points to the, I think, a very important distinction you made about translation working from a script. Because I think, to me, the distinction occurs is that when I'm translating, if I like a poet, that's for example, I also do essentially poetry. If I decide that I trans, I want to translate that poet, 
the first thing I do, that's the only way I can translate really, is that what do I like about the sport? <laughs> and I translate my perception of what is valuable in that sport. So that in a strange way, every translation for me starts with a misreading of the total text, <laughs> destruction of the total text. And when the translation occurs, the process then becomes a much more self-conscious process of what are the tools of my trade or my knowledge that in, in the target language I can use to reap kind of in a parallel space to, to create something that to my mind it, it this echoes, uh, reincarnates really in a way, and there is an alchemical to it. Mm -hmm that experience. Mm -hmm. But in a way, it is very, because I think to me the most dangerous, I mean, it's not dangerous, I mean, it's a fact of life, uh, that the biggest obstacle we have to really to be able to talk about translation is that we think of translation as reproduction, okay? They said we are replicating, reproducing an original, okay? Where is actual, and then you can say, you know, translation is impossible, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, well, it's betraying the original. It's not like this, you know, some of the most important works in a, in a, in a, in a language are the translations, you know. Is it, but if you want to accept the idea that to some extent uh, you are destroying the original conceptually, mm -hmm. it liberates you to get things from it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, that's, that's really what I want to say. Yeah. So, something Stephen said uh, set off in my mind sort of the essential difference in my visual concept is a dance. And as we all know, there's solo dance, but there's partner dance. And what we try to do is be a partner ice skater, a partner in language, with the author in a sense, but eventually with the text. And so I'm not trying to reproduce and do everything, but if the partner's lifting an arm, and the partner, in this case, that text is the leader, and I'm the follower, but is in any good dance thing, there are times when the text responds to me as the translator. And I think what we look for in a good translation is, have they stumbled? Is there a, a miss? Is one arm down and one arm out? And because I dance differently than Dick, the same text will get a slightly different uh, performance, but it's always partnering. And so I suggest the word of language partner, um, something like that, of, of what we try to do. A, a partnership, something more, a better word than that maybe, but something that really reminds that we're in constant um, movement with the text, and some of us are bad. <laughs> and they, and you Dance find well. others, the, the text will find other partners. Present company excluded. Oh, we're not all great dancers. It's a so that was, that's my, we're not all great dancers with any partner. <coughs> with yes. the right partner, we can become excellent dancers. Yes. I think that's knowing your, li your limits as a translator as well, which I find hmm. extremely important. That's a beautiful metaphor, and I think we, you know, we 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 sort of clustered metaphors yeah. around us today, and that still leaves us with the you know, where what's the center that all these metaphors are clustering around? I, I, it's so hard to get at the center, which is the the non-figurative way of describing what we do. I mean, I'm contributing to the the, yeah. this, the, 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 the onslaught of metaphors just as much as anybody else. It's not, you know, but can, can't, can, can't we find a way of talking about what we do that's not through the other arts or through? One word I don't think I've heard in this whole conversation is a, a word that I, frequently remind people is required of a translator, and that is imagination. 
Um, and I don't know if imagination is a metaphor for anything, but, <laughs> but the act of translation is an act of imagination. Um, and I think it's important you know, for us not only to keep that in mind while we're working, but when we're talking to other people about what we do, you know, that... that Reimagining. It, imagining, yeah, imagining. It, the, 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 the translation is an act of imagination, um, just in, in a very analogous way to the original composition. Uh, one of the things I found myself saying recently was that the process of translating for me is just as mysterious as the process of writing an original poem. Uh, because I don't really know. I mean, uh, people tell me I'm a good translator and I say, well, thanks, you know, but I don't, I can't explain what it is I do or, or why, you know, I have an instinct for it that, that often works. Um, so it, 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 is, uh, it, it is a creative act that, that I think that is one way we can talk about it with people who aren't initiates um, and, and to remind them that although we are constrained by the original and we are, we do have these moral and ethical obligations to not betray the original, um, we also have to have the confidence to trust our own imaginations. Reimagining what you just said, that's a good word. That's a good I word. think that should go on the list. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. So in this conversation, I find myself going back and wanting to play the devil's advocate and say we need to get back. So there's all these wonderful um, images and metaphors and senses of what we all do, and we all know we do it. And yet, when one of us gets up in front of a crowd and says, this is the literal meaning. And, and I, I think I'm almost going a full around and saying, and kind of like what you're saying, uh, yes, but, and all these things are lovely, but if we can't write about this, we can't be in, in, a, in a review, we can't use these images. And then if we do, people who aren't in our field will say, oh, you mean you just kind of look at the text and then write whatever you want? And then I go back to, no, we have an ethical obligation. We are translators. We have an ethical obligation to be as, and I'm going to say it, as literal as possible. So OK, so how can we talk about that side of what we do? And so yes, there's all this other stuff. And we're, we're writers, and we're creators, and we're imaginary, and we're all these things, and we're poets. But how do we talk about the, the skill-based? I, I find it a little bit, um, I don't know if sad is the right word, but that we are, we feel um, obliged to justify what we do. Like everything we're talking about is how do we talk about what we do. I mean, I think, a, I don't even know how to say this, a quantum physicist or whatever, has to talk about what he or she does in a way, or what they do, as we were talking about, in a way <laughs> that's, um, uh, difficult and also uses constant metaphors. I don't think the metaphors are in and of themselves the problem. I think the problem is why do we all feel that there's some need to justify what they do? And does every single field feel, or is it just because in academia we feel we need to, or because we feel put upon <coughs> by the larger word? When I, asked, when I was asked what it is that I do as a translator, I said, I quote David Markson, who said, when Schubert was asked to play to the meaning of the piece that he had just played, he sat down at the piano and played it again. <laughs> and that's what I say that I do as a translator. I sit, and now it's a metaphor, but I sit down at the piano and I play right. the book again, but this time in, in English. English. Which could, you could use a metaphor as a different key, yes. a different tone, but it is a metaphor, and people will grasp that, and then I feel, I'm just going to be Schubert, and then I'm done. I play it again, and I don't <laughs> feel like justice <coughs> at this point yeah. in yeah. our careers. Why are we fighting I God? think not part I, of the reason why, we, other than the stuff to do with departments and jobs right, and, and right, pay right. and getting more than one sentence in the review, um, the reason why we do this is there's this problem about invisibility, right? If one of our, if, if a lot of the time we're and it's a contradiction in what we do, because a lot of the time we're trying to be invisible. Um, but being invisible makes us invisible. So I think that <laughs> may somehow be part of the problem. Also, I want to come back to the other like, 
purpose here to see fascism, if there are any thoughts fascism. about that. Right, which is <laughs> besides the question of how we talk about what we do, does this have to do with what other people do and what other things do with, it, the, the, with this question of um, the other problem with the literal is the assumption that everything has one best interpretation. Exactly. The Bible, the Koran, the Gita, everything has one best interpretation. And we know the kind of problems that leads to. So I don't know if people have any, and, and, and we're kind of forcing that into this thing of talking about how we talk about what we do, but I'm curious if, if anyone has thoughts about that, about how our practice or, or how we talk about it has anything to do with helping the world get away from this notion that things have one meaning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I taught high school French, and one of the first uh, things I had to teach them was about translation. Uh, first year French students, I would give them an assignment, write me a short paragraph about something that happened to you last week in French. So inevitably, you know, 90% of the class would write their thing in English, and then they put it through an online translator <laughs> and proudly bring it back to me. And I said, oh, you went online to translate this. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> so then I would give them a French paragraph. And I'd say, take this home, put it through an online translator. And they'd come back the next day and say, that's not English. That's not English. Right. Well, that's an interesting. That was a literal translation. I, I just want to respond for a second to the, the this question of self-justification because I don't really think. I mean, I don't work in academia. I don't. I, I mean, I've been doing this long enough that I don't even care what other people think about what I do. You know, I just do it. <laughs> but but there is the the curious person who is not a literary person necessarily, like who, you know, is that a reading I give or something. And inevitably, if I give a reading and I divide it between like my original writing and, and my translation, <coughs> most of the questions are about translation because people are curious, you know, and I think this is hmm. one of the motives for Katie's calling this panel together is that, you know, it's not so much to, to explain ourselves to our dean, but to, but to like sympathetic uh, readers who, who say, wow, translation, I never really thought about what it takes mm -hmm. to be a translator, you know? And, and so, I mean, it's partly an educational function for us to, to help sympathetic people understand, you know, not by defending ourselves, but just by kind of explaining how what we do is different from what they might have thought before they started thinking about it. <laughs> before they started thinking about it. Right, so that, <laughs> like that. the okay. positive corollary to the taxonomy of the ignorance about translation exactly. is the taxonomy of curiosity about translation. Right. Elizabeth. Um, I'd like to suggest that, um, because you say that we all use literal literal all the time, that, that we, uh, from now on, that whenever we use it, it always has quotes around it, <laughs> you know? Every time. But, you know, yeah, that, do, I mean, air yeah. do air quotes, do air quotes. Yeah, that, I mean, at least. At least do that, that, that yes. We, whenever you talk about literal, because we, sometimes we really do need to use it, that we always counter it, you know, and, and um, or somehow explain it, or somehow yeah. qual qual qualify it, yeah. Something that I find that I say is like, a meaning commonly associated with this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <Yeah>. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> or if we were to take this word out of the context, <laughs> mm -hmm. it can often be, yeah. Translators And you don't have to have like 60 definitions, dictionary definitions of a word to have a crisis over, you know, no, which, right. which is like even three <laughs> well, that's to right. use. And, you know, that's a function of, and I've, I've used, I've used in, in discussing this with people who ask me about, you know, translation, and, and I, I use the, the, the Spanish verb es, esperar, mm -hmm. which means to hope, to wait, or to expect. Those are three really different things. I mean, those are three of probably another 20 meanings, but, but the, the, you know, just getting people thinking about, oh, well, how do you decide which one to use, you know? And, and explaining, well, you have to read in context, and what I... Is Polonius behind that curtain? Yeah, frequent, fr frequently say to one of my colleagues who shows me your translations is, you know, you're, you're looking at the trees and not the forest, and, and you really have to step back from this one line or this one word and, and, and you know, read the whole stanza or the whole poem and 
figure out what the whole thing is about before you know what this word is about. Hi. Uh, this is Sullivan. Excellent. Um, I don't know if this is productive or not, but in terms of taxonomy of ignorance, uh, the worst uh, experiences I've had have actually been with editors. And I recently had an editor, I said this in public, and an editor was, I thought I had a chance to have it up, feel like what a translator feels like when somebody says, oh, but you know, you're not doing this right. Um, these editors are actually even more invisible than we are yes. because they really never get their name on the cover, although yes. apparently in France sometimes. But um, <laughs> if in, my understanding of this, and I don't know, I didn't study literature, so I don't know enough about it, but from what I hear, uh, people who study literature aren't taught that the, what they're studying is the translation. So um, the most difficult experiences I've had have been. Uh, and it, it's a, it is a crisis then because you're in the editing process and you're dealing with an editor who thinks that what you're doing is something more like what we're talking about, uh, that it is a transfer of words. And having to make a decision about, um, on the other hand, they are a reader who's um, giving you feedback on whether or not the translation is convincing, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, having to make a decision in that moment you have one week or you have two weeks to go through this um, book. Uh, w which battles am I going to fight about trying to um, get my decisions approved versus uh, convincing this or explaining to this editor what I do and why uh, they might want to think about it differently? You know, um, I mean, I think that that to me would be the number one. Uh, uh, Category in that taxonomy of ignorance. To, to, uh, take Are you on. taking notes, Jason? <laughs> they're, they're the front line between me and the rest of the world, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's terrible. I don't. I don't want to think I'm in a war, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that's a really good point because I'm sure we've all had these experiences where, you know, you're translating somebody who has a very baroque style, for example, and and any it, style. Right, or any style. <laughs> <laughs> that's where it usually goes. Yeah. It's like taking out the style. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And 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 but the ignorance, the ignorance of the editor who thinks, well, Americans don't read sentences like yeah. this. Well, I don't know. You ever read Henry James or or <laughs> you know uh, Saul yeah. Bellow or any number yeah. of other people James who Jones. I mean there is not one American oh, style, you know. Yeah. And and to to reduce your reader to the you know to the person who only knows how to read. Uh, uh, Hemingway, or or you know, who's a good example of, of something that has you know been reduced to a, this kind of simplicity. Um, you do need to educate your editor. You know, you know the word the word foreignizing winds up in my classroom <laughs> as meaning approximately conscious of and attempting to communicate something about the original style. Wow. Yeah. Because of yeah. the sort of default erasure that, you know, that we all know better than to do, or I think, um, but but that students don't understand yet. But editors, I have the same thing. Well, maybe that goes back to this idea of harnessing the potential of the English language. Maybe that's a way of talking about it to editors too, of sort yeah. of, well, I'm 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 stretching English. I'm, this is something I can do in English, mm -hmm. and that can be done. And uh, you know, are there any editors in the room here? <laughs> well, yeah. I've, I've done. <laughs> yeah, but these are like all these are like brilliant poet translators. I've edited. More, I've edited. More, 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 more. I think they're our most important allies. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and the good and the good ones get this. Oh yeah. You know, and, and some of us are lucky to work with those yeah. sometimes. Somebody else had a hand up. Yes. Yeah. Um, for me, there's a lot of the stuff implicit in everything that everybody has said. And one of the important things that um, I think is underneath it, but I think it's really important that we start including in our discussions among ourselves and however that works out to the public or to the mm -hmm. critic or the, the editor, is um, what we do first is reading the text and rereading the text and rereading the text, how many times it takes, and then we're going along translating. Well, maybe I'm the only one who does this, but I just keep changing words to try to 
pull the reading into more of itself. Mm -hmm. um, but we are literary critics first. We are we analyze literature first. And we do that either because we know the language and that's the most like homogenous way to do it and probably the most fun way to do it. Some people do that. They bring in a reader, a native speaker, or somebody to help them read it. And we hardly ever talk about our reading process here at Alta or it, um, I never see anything about that. And I think that's something that translators have to learn how to do, how to read literature. And the language of literature is so different from the language of science or even history, although that's also creative writing in its own way. Um, and that, what the nature of literary language is, I would love to see more panels on both literary analysis and reading um, as a way of just getting us talking about Right, so going from what you said to sort of, I think, you sort of expanded a little bit on what I had said at the beginning, which looking at a translation as how, how deep and broad exactly. is the reading behind this translation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's on the conference committee here? <laughs> there was somebody else over here. Yeah, uh, this is related to what the remarks just made. Uh, I translated a so-called experimental text, a very difficult novel by Jürgen Leder, a Swiss writer. Oh, I know. And then the, the Swiss sponsoring agency, the Poetia, asked me to write a little column uh, about difficult texts, about experimental texts. And uh, what I ended up saying was, I would recommend that you approach these texts, no matter if it's in your, your native language or not, as if you were translating them. Right? And that's a little bit of George Steiner, of course, but, but it's specifically for this purpose of reading difficult texts. You stick with the text, you don't let go, right. you uh, tough out the tough spots is what I Right, say. and that goes back to, again, getting back to what we do, which is, which is not free form. It's right. not right. writing. It is staying close to the text. So the analogy with reading is another way we can yeah. let people, most people read, are the ones we are talking to. That's, that's translation. Well, I hope this was useful, get us thinking and talking in different ways, more consciously, a little bit. <laughs> baby steps. Yeah, baby steps. Thank you all for... Thank you.